साइकोलॉजी की प्रोफेसर भी रह चुकी हैं और इंडिया की सबसे फियरलेस ऑथर्स में से एक ये कहलाती हैं उनकी पहली बुक थी जो फादर डियरेस्ट 2003 में बेस्ट सेलर की लिस्ट में पहुंची है और उस बुक के साथ कहीं पर ये डेयर डेविल का टैग इनके साथ लग गया है सेकेंड बुक मर्चेंट्स ऑफ डेथ भी बहुत ही क्रिटिकल अक्लेम पा चुकी हैं और ये तीसरी पुस्तक है द सीक्रेट बुक ऑफ कस्तूरबा जिसमें मैंने और आपने ऐसी बातें हैं जो कभी ना जानी है और ना उस दृष्टिकोण से देखी है उस बातों के बारे में बात होने वाली है सो आई वुड रिक्वेस्ट पद्म भूषण अवार्डी इज निलिमा दालमिया मदर नॉट प्रेजेंट हेयर बट वी आर गोइंग टू टॉक अबाउट द बुक इन अ शॉर्ट वाइल और आई वुड रिक्वेस्ट दैम की वी कैन leave the session open thank you arti good afternoon everybody and thank you for making time to be here this afternoon it's a sunday and i know it's past lunch time but uh, i think what is going to be uh, what is going to unfold is indeed captivating this book called the secret diary of kasturba was just recently launched on november 25th so we are really privileged to have nilima with us today and i thought uh, to just set a context i would like to request nilima to please uh, read excerpts from the book and help us to understand her kasturba and her journey from being a young child to becoming the mother of this nation so i'm going to ask nilima to please read some excerpts I'll start with uh, her childhood, and uh, I'll read some excerpts as uh, her life evolves. Uh, I've chosen some in uh, consultation with Anupa, and I I think you'll get a flavor of the book from there. I was named Kasturb after the seductive scent that the world knows as musk. This heady intoxicant is the rarest and most potent of aphrodisiacs that ooze from the follicles around the navel of the male musk deer. Down the ages in his quest for this fragrant potion that symbolizes divine and sensuous love, men have slaughtered thousands of these hapless and beautiful creatures. The deer wanders around in its habitat, maddened by this erotic odor. that emanates from deep within its own stomach till it is hunted down by human predators a curse of its birth that drives it to certain destruction call it the curse of my birth or the burden of my name but there i was kasturb the youngest of three siblings enjoying a privileged position as my two elder sisters had died considered to be a divine gift from heaven my parents treated me with excessive indulgence and care this is the tour she is the only daughter of these wealthy cloth merchants the kapadias and uh, she had two elder sisters jo child by bahut jaldi wo unki mrityu ho gayi so what i tried to do is that i tried to form a connection between uh, kastur the scent and her name and uh, the scent of kastur is clouded in uh, violence because the the deer is hunted down and then the kastur is extracted and made into the scent that we all know so i have tried to draw a parallel between her name and and we believe that names have a great impact on the lives of people so this is pretty much what i have tried to do in my way is draw a parallel between the violence that the deer is met with and the ultimate non violent violence that kasturba is going to meet with in her life okay now uh, kasturba is married and she's gone to rajkot she was 13 when she married uh, gandhi ji and he was 12 he was a year younger than as twilight enveloped the city and shadows of darkness caused 
cast spooky patterns on the floor of the tiled courtyard, everyone dispersed and headed to their quarters. Believing it would be a magical night, as my older sisters-in-law had insinuated, I shyly followed Mohandas to his small room on the first floor of the house with my heart beating wildly. Mohandas bolted the door behind me. The room was strewn with rose petals and a sweet aroma had diffused in the air around. An oil lantern that stood on a stool near the window was burning brightly. A tiny earthen lamp laden with layers of black soot flickered faintly in one corner. The bed was covered with a vegetable dye counterpane that had tribal motifs patched on it. Mohandas sat down on the bed. I stood beside him with my head bent, not knowing what I was expected to do. He leaned back on the pillow and turned around to face me. He looked bewildered and I could sense his nervousness. He fumbled, unsure of himself. I stood there in silence, waiting for him to speak. After what seemed like an eternity, he smiled. My entire body was seized by lightness, a feeling that was both euphoric and new. This was my lord and master, and my mother had told me that he had a right on me to do as he pleased. All kinds of stirring surged through my body and mind. A warm glow diffused slowly within me, and I could feel a rapid throbbing. I slackened every nerve and gave myself unto him as if it was an offering to the gods a complete and open surrender. My marriage was consummated 72 hours after we were wed. I had finally joined the exalted ranks of my sisters-in-law, Ganga and Harpuwar. The sight of four crescent-shaped scratch marks of my nails on his back aroused me. The feeling that Mohandas and I had embarked on a novel journey of passion into a world of self-discovery and erotica was thrilling. So this kind of gives you a flavor of the house that she went into and her initial uh, interaction with her husband and uh, uh, and yeah, the, their first night together. Should I carry on or do you want to say something? Uh, the purpose of asking Nilima to read excerpts is for us to get a sense of her idea of Kasturba and Kasturba's life. Uh, we know that several books have been written on Gandhiji's life and but in all of these books um, she hasn't been written about as the protagonist and while this is a biofiction uh, it's interesting to see how the author interprets the character's life and you know this is just to give you a flavor of the book so uh, this is the chapter which is when uh, Gandhiji and uh, Kasuba and the two younger boys are in South Africa. And Harilal, the eldest one who had been left behind, has now come to join them. So Kasuba is waiting impatiently for uh, to receive her son. I had been waiting impatiently that day, pacing up and down. I had stepped out of the doorway several times, gazing at the dusty road that led to the settlement. Little Ramdas and Devda stayed by my side, clutching on to me awaiting the arrival of their brother. Harilal arrived and came straight to me and touched his forehead to my feet. My eyes brimmed over as I stroked his head and lifted him up from the floor. Oh, how much I have missed you, my son. How I have yearned for this day, I mumbled, choking on my words. I held him in my arms for a long time, not wanting to let go. He stood silently, whilst I, the aching mother, who had pined for him all these years, had burst open a dam of unspoken grievances and unexchanged missives of love. We wept. Where is Manilal, he asked, noticing the only younger two who were also crying. He goes to a dispensary nearby to nurse the patients. Babu has assigned him his duty. He should be back soon, I said, wiping his face with the pallu of my sari. He sponges them, dispenses medicines, and he assists in their care. Harila looked bewildered. You don't need to be a doctor for that, I added quickly, sensing his confusion. What about the two of you? He had circled his arms around the younger brothers. Are you going to school? 
Or are you still being taught at home by Bapu? There is a slight sarcasm in his voice. Bapu teaches us when he's here, but it's been a holiday these days, Motabhai. They quipped. In Bapu's absence, we don't study. We have other chores to do. We collect letters. We work the pumps in the orchards. We till the land and sometimes we do carpentry. I could see Harilal's face contort in frustration. Come, Motabhai, let's go out, Ramdas was tugging at his brother's sleeve. There are lovely oranges in full bloom in Phoenix. You will be thrilled to see them. The boys traipsed out to the fruit orchards. I could hear their merry twittering and laughter streaming into the kitchen while I heated up the food. Harilal's anxious face disturbed me, but somewhere in my mind, I wanted to believe that all would be well. The, uh, the emphasis here is on the fact that Gandhiji did not allow his children to go to school. And there was a constant conflict between him and Kasturba because she insisted that they should go to regular schools. And he said that the real schooling, the real education is character building. So she was deeply upset by this decision of his. And much as she struggled and tried, she was never able to overcome that. solitude in Sabarmati prison was contemplating his role in the destiny of his nation. I was constantly fretting about the fate of my family. There was no respite for me at the ashram. I had to preside over the daily activities and most importantly keep the morale high. Harilal remained a deep wound in my heart. His failed business ventures, his weakness for carnal pleasures, his addiction to alcohol, his never-ending demand for money had hurled me into a pit of gloom. The other three boys were still unmarried. With their father locked away indefinitely, I took it upon myself to find suitable matches for the younger three, who were all well past the age of marriage. Manilal was foremost on my mind. Far away and alone in Phoenix, he was managing the Indian opinion efficiently, but there had been reports of his being restless and miserable. Even at the age of 30, there were no prospects of his betrothal in sight, a thought which constantly troubled me. The day after his arrest, Mohandas shot off a letter to Manilal from his prison cell at Sabarmati. So, Babu writes a letter to Manilal telling him that if you are thinking of marriage, uh, you should remember that you are under a vow, because Manilal had been expelled from the ashram. Uh, because of a certain uh, incident which happened. And he had been made to take a 12-year vow of celibacy. So he uh, reminds him by sending him a letter that you still have to uh, follow that vow. You'll be breaking the vow if you want to get married. The hard-hitting letter from his father made Manilal sad. His loneliness intensified at those discomforting words of clinical counsel that resounded in his head. I felt equally disturbed. But somewhere in the folds of my heart, I felt a deep anguish for Mohanlas. It tore me apart to think that along with grave apprehensions about his own uncertain fate, how several other burning conflicts were being doused by him under that mask of composure and detachment. My thoughts pulled me back again to Harila. At 34, he was aimless, he was jobless and wavered. He suffered from all the vagaries of a wasting vagabond, yet his ego and obstinacy prevented him from coming to live at Savarmati. To him, the asceticism, asceticism of an ashram life was far worse than incarceration in a prison, fair, prison cell and living with Bapu, another hell. Thank you, Nilima. So I think this gives us a flavor of um, Nilima's uh, approach towards the character of Kasturba and I was talking to her this morning there is a writer uh, to 
work with a character that has already got so much um, aura around it, you know, a character that is of national importance, what exactly drew you to a figure like Kasturba? And um, in turn, what made you position this book as a secret diary? Uh, I disagree with you, Anupa, that uh, this is a character that has been documented and a lot is known about. Because frankly, when I started reading about Kasturba, I found nothing there about her. So it was always, it was almost as if she wasn't there. And the only abiding image we all had of Kasturba was the one from uh, Richard Attenborough's film, in which she's this sari clad, khadi clad, uh, wheel spinning figure who um, has no voice and no expression. And she comes and goes and you almost miss her. She could need not have made her. So I came across a saying in which uh, Albert Einstein some 75 years ago had said that, uh, that the generations to come will find it hard to believe that a person such as this, he was talking of Gandhiji, walked in flesh and blood on the earth. So while I hugely revere Gandhiji, and I'm totally in sync with what Albert Einstein said, but what riled me was that he didn't walk alone. Kasturba was beside him from the moment they were married till the time she died. So there is a story there. There is two sides to a story, which is his side and her side. And the third side is the truth. So I tried to I tried to get into the character of Kasturba, live her character, you know, cry, breathe, live, talk, feel like her. And uh, I, I just felt that there's a great deal of injustice done to her by historians because nobody has written anything about Kasturba. There is one biography by Arun and Sunanda Gandhi, Arun is her grandson, which also is Gandhi-centric. It has chronicled the events in Kasturba's life, but it's like a hagiography to Gandhi. It is, it is again where everybody has revered Gandhi, the Mahatma, but nobody talks about Kasturba's contribution to the making of the Mahatma. So I found it compelling to, uh, to uh, sculpt this character. And I began writing it in the spirit that what would I have done had I been Kasturba. Right. So, I'll uh, answer your second question. Is why did you call it secret diary? Yeah. Because when I started writing, I didn't intend it to be a diary. I didn't want it to be a simple from home to tomb chronicle in the third person. I wanted to give it her voice, which is largely clouded by my voice. But um, it took the shape of a diary when I, it finally manifested in the shape of a manuscript. So it was nice to call it a diary and secret is both enticing and it's mysterious and it's also because there was no diary. So in a way I'm just trying to, it's a, it's a more enticing word than probably imagined diary. And um, what was the process of evoking Kasturba's in the spaces like? You know, can you describe what it felt like and how much of transference do you think occurs from the author to the character? See, invading Kasturba's space for me was not much of a challenge because I was born in the decade post-independence and my father and we being Marwaris have a very similar cultural ethos like Kasturba and Gandhi's family. So we follow the same customs, we belong to the same subset, we're both Vaishnavs, uh, we have the same food habits, the same kind of, uh, of sanskars, if you want to say. Uh, so it was easy for me to get into the character because I thought I was rewriting a story. Uh, and just to put the reference in perspective, that the first book I wrote was called Father Dearest because I wrote my father's biography. So effectively, I often felt that I was writing a story which could be called Mother Dearest. So actually it was easy for me to get into the character of Kasturba uh, because I thought I was living my mother's story and my own story in the, in the story sagas of the sons. And, uh, you know, the picture that I came away with after reading the book um, is almost akin to that she is like every Indian woman who must shape under the sort of hold of patriarchy. 
and so in that sense, is this also a commentary on Indian women? Yes, indeed it is. Indeed it is because uh, uh, I think the abiding spirit of all Indian women, particularly of our generation, is the spirit of Adi Shakti, the omniscient mother. So we have glorified martyrdom and sacrifice and uh, and grief and tragedy, and we have uh, romanticized it. So it is the ethos of the Indian woman of probably my generation, and. Um, I think she comes out uh, as the all-pervading, all-powerful spirit, which cannot be destroyed. Right, but um, the Kasturba that you present in the book also seems like a very angry person. That's my reading of the character, and possibly some amount of latent frustration tends to spill through the book. So I was just wondering again to go back to this idea of um, the author imposing their own sort of sense of um, injustice and it's being um, put in the voice of the character. So I'm just talking about authorial imposition. Uh, there, there are two parts to this question. One is that do you believe that Vasudha was an angry bitter right. And the second part is that uh, have you projected yourself into Yes. Well, uh, the answer to this is there's a bit of both because knowing her as I studied from the little bit of information that I got that she was a strong, bold, fearless, passionate girl who came from a very wealthy family who had to adjust in different circumstances when she got married, I find it very hard to correlate a dumped down Kasturba to that image. So I do not believe that Kasturba had no reactions and she was mute and she took everything by the way. She must have had anger and I would put this question to you. How would you like it if you see your, your husband uh, inflicting tyranny and torture on yourself? Yes. Would that be angry or not? Sure, but I would be asking whether um, you know, when we do research on books like this, if your research is from secondary sources, then uh, some of what we put together in a publication like this and attribute it to the protagonist. It's, it's almost fictionalized, right? No. There, is, uh, there are enough uh, instances in which have been docu documented in Gandhiji's own experiments for truth where Kasurba has had violent reactions to his right, behavior. Right. Uh, I'll give you an example. is when they were returning from South Africa and uh, the, the Indian community had given them a whole lot of very expensive presents and farewell gifts and there was this beautiful gold necklace which somebody presented to Kasturba and she put it on and she was thrilled with it and you know she danced around with it and she said I'm going to take it back home and I'm going to give it to the wives of my sons and she was she was delighted with that and uh, Gandhiji said no it's not yours you will have to take it back it will go into a trust because this belongs to the Congress party it doesn't belong to us so she has an angry outburst Gandhiji uh, I think Harila or one of the boys has put on one of the watches and she says, son, you can take this home, this watch belongs to you. So he makes him take off the watch and he tells the boy to, to tell her that we don't need these things. We will not marry girls who will ask for jewelry. And Gandhiji tells her that, you know, whatever you want, I am there to provide for you. Why do you need these things? And she has this angry tantrum and outburst where she says to him, but you don't have anything to give me. What are you going to give me? <laughs> there are evidences elsewhere to show, and from that I have surmised some of the ones which are not here, that she did have angry outbursts, she had a simmering anger, yes she was totally devoted to her husband because the women of those times knew nothing better, uh, but uh, she, she met with frustration in her, her parting, the closing line in that chapter which I have written when Gandhiji is coming back from South Africa, is that I gave up that necklace, I knew I would never see it again, and I knew that his will would always prevail. So there's a sense of resignation which is which is flavored with frustration. Yes, I, I, of course I've projected myself into it because that is how I would have felt. But I don't think it's too uh, 
too far or too contradictory to our character. Thank you. Yeah. We, we will take questions in a while. No, can we can we take questions after? It's not a good question. Yeah. I will read how she has portrayed that one incident in a book. In South Africa, Gandhi drove drove Kasturba out of the house. I have written about it. Yeah, it's in the book. Yeah, I would like you. Do you want to keep that? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. I think somebody else has a question, but can we take questions after? Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. We'll read this exercise. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's move the conversation to another place. Uh, I was just interested in knowing, uh, Nilima, that do you have any ideological affinities to Gandhism? Uh, indeed I do. I revere and hugely worship uh, Gandhiji the freedom fighter. That uh, enduring image of the naked fakir who went to, uh, you know, to, to talk to Churchill and, 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 uh, and have that round table conference which was the culmination and finally the getting of our freedom, that will never leave me. And uh, the contribution that Gandhiji had in getting us to where we were, he could spar with the gods, he could argue with the devil in pursuit of his mission. I hugely revere that Gandhi. And uh, his self-righteousness, his determination to pursue his goals at any cost, uh, the cost sometimes was detrimental and uh, the casualties were his family. But regardless of that, I, even though I have a huge sympathy for Kasturba, but I feel that that attribute of Gandhi, which drove him to his goal, unmindful of anything that he has. And his pursuit of the truth is something that I want to, like, it's like a, sh it's a shrine in my head. And I worship that hugely. So there's that aspect as well, um, the persona of Gandhi as the father of the nation and the husband. So there are these two different, I mean, dichotomies that we see through the book. And the book shifts from, um, Kasturba's voice to your voice to, as you mentioned, a third voice. And so is that intentional? Is that how you structure the book? Uh, actually, this book just took on a life of its own. I, uh, like I told you, I became the character of Kasturba and it will be hard for me to tell you is where it's my voice and where it's Kasturba. So although I tried like a honest or like a faithful biographer, to divorce myself from the protagonist, but I have to admit that I have so perforated that soul, particularly because I have lived that life in my house with my mother and with my father, that uh, it's it's very hard to distinguish where I have its her voice and it's my voice. And then there is a third voice there, which is the narrator. Now it did not, uh, I did not intend it to be like that. But that is the way the narrative just happened. So you will see three distinct tones in the book. Right. It's me, it's Kasturba, and then another third observer. Particularly comes out when after the death of Kasturba, I have still kept her alive. Because she, the book ends with Gandhiji's death. Whereas if it's a book on Kasturba, it should have ended with that death. Right. But she trails him right to his death, which clearly is the third voice in the book. Yes, and there's a sense of um, absence which runs right through the book. So there's longing, there's finding, there's absence. So you run with all these human characteristics of Kasturba. Of course, it is your interpretation of Kasturba. So I would like to call her your Kasturba. And um, do you do you also think that there were moments of happiness because she also yes. comes across as a very vulnerable person? Yes, yes. But but Kasturba's basic core personality was. She was a bubbling, very happy, very pampered child. Um, I won't say that there was no happiness in her Sukhpa's She did take joy. And uh, particularly the time, there are defining moments in the manuscript, in the narrative, where, um, I'll tell you, the one which appeared to me the most defining moment is after the salt march, when she sees the whole nation galvanized on one call of Gandhiji, they all come out on the streets to break the salt law is when she goes through this immense awakening inside her up to that point 
there was an element of just submission that okay, I'm just going along with the tide. But that is when she sits back and she says that, uh, you know, the, I'm married to a phenomenal man. And a lot of the anguish that she feels in the marriage may at that point have been blunted by that revelation to herself. So although there is a underlying uh, very strong thread of separation, that pining that, that you know, either, either living without her husband or living without the son or something or the other. But I think pretty much that is the ethos of the Indian woman. You know, if you, if you see all of our generation films were based on, on female, on tragedy of the Hindu woman. So it's a constant tragedy was glorified and romanticized. So yes, it is there. My last question for the day is that as a writer, you know, all of us as writers, we take liberties with characters. But at any point, did you ever feel like where do you draw the line when you're writing about the intimate personal life of um, a character that has also historical importance and is also revered in the eyes of the nation? And here the book presents Kasturba as a very human, alive woman with passion. And so did you feel like there was a need to draw a line? No, never. Because uh, in all my writings and all three books, I have treated uh, sexuality as a very sacred attribute which is given to every organism by God, uh, uh, why should we shy away from it? And uh, I have dealt with sexuality without compromising on race. Uh, all my books are heavily loaded with uh, the sexuality of the protagonist. And here in Kasturba and Gandhi's case, I don't think I have uh, invaded any privacy because Gandhiji's prime tenet was that he spoke about every aspect of his life very <coughs> candidly. And even at the risk of, uh, of offending the sensibilities of some of the people around him, which he did, he didn't care because he said that at, the, at this point he wanted to make everything he did because he so profoundly believed in his experiments that he wanted to, the world to know that this is the path to the ultimate liberation of the soul. So I do not think I've done any uh, uh, invasion of that privacy I sought and I am not really bound by uh, these kind of reservations. Because like I said, that why, why should we adopt a Victorian puritanical method of dealing with what God has given us as a, as a main attribute of, of the human being? I get your point entirely. I think my uh, question was much broader and larger, where as an author or a writer, at what point do you start respecting the dignity and the, what shall I say, the, the privacy of your character? I would do that. I would, for instance, if I was writing about, uh, if I was writing about, uh, name any other protagonist, I can't keep the name coming to me. I would respect that. But when I've written about my own life, uh, I've written my father's life, okay, I have done, treated it with exactly the same way as I've done in the book of time. So I think this is also a very subjective, uh, what should I say, restraint. So what may be uh, offensive to one may not be offensive to the other. And I have anyway grown up in a home of oddities because of, uh, my father had six wives and I'm the fourth child of the six wives. So there were ambiguous uh, moralities in our home. So for me, probably it is a corroded sense of, uh, if you want to call it restraint. But I don't think uh, there is a need for that. Yeah, I mean, it's not you about cheapening. It. It's not about judgment. Yeah, it's not about it's judgment. It's again very subjective. Yeah, how you want to deal with a particular subject, whether you want to couch it in a safe basket, it's also your own expression. Right. And I think it's reflective of your own character and personality as well. So uh, I'm going to encourage everybody to get a copy of this book because it casts completely new light on Kasuba and. I'd like to throw it open to the audience for questions now at this point. Yes. Um, we're just going to try and locate that passage for you. Yeah. Yeah. Meanwhile, I'd like to know how Kasuba reacted to the Gandhi's uh, 
idea of sleeping with two girls or testing his celibacy, you know. How was the reaction of that as well? How a wife would react to it? Well, any husband. wife, uh, I know it would be very seriously disturbing for a wife to deal with that. But Kasturba was a very tolerant wife. We know that. Kasturba was a very tolerant wife and that was one of the reasons why I say that Kasturba has a huge contribution in the making of the Mahatma. But uh, to be fair to him, the Kasturba died in 44 and the most exploding experiments happened after she died. Although that Sagla may be uh, involvement, which Gandhiji writes about himself, that was before she died. So there are times when Kasturba has taken a strident approach and she put her foot down. Like, uh, for instance, in, in South Africa, he had this habit of sleeping out outdoors. He didn't like to sleep indoors. And um, he got pneumonia, he was sick. And so the doctor said that it's a very harsh winter. You need to sleep indoors. And uh, Meera Ben, that is in Natalie's state, Papa shot into my uh, hut. And uh, somebody else offered. So Kasuba stood up and said, no, Baku will sleep in my So there are times when she has come forward and she put her foot down. When the, it has assaulted her sensibility too much. But by and large, Kasuba was a very tall towards the end of the book where you describe that after she's died and she's still hovering around the spirit, she, she kind of sees that yes. scene. Yes, So uh, that is, there's no evidence to prove uh, otherwise, but uh, all along I have found, except in one or two cases where it disturbed her immensely, she has just let it ride. She's dead. I don't know which woman would do that today, by the way. Sorry to interrupt in between. Uh, the session that was supposed to start in Set Plaza, that is making the world's second largest novel in Gujarati, has already started. So anyone who is interested can please uh, proceed there. And the session uh, that was supposed to start at Panoria Lawns, filling the items of Ahmedabad, has also started. So you can proceed if you are uh, interested in that session, session as well. We hope you'll stay here. <laughs> what is it also an interesting session going on? Yes. So we'll take another question there. Yeah, uh, you partly answered the questions that I had with you. Uh, the answers to Rupa's questions, but I still must ask you because it is partly answered. One is that, uh, see, there is there is this angst in Indian, uh, in Indian history and in Indian writing. Uh, we date back, this dates back to Siddhartha, uh, Yashodhara, his wife, exactly. and uh, Urmila, Lakshman's wife, and uh, Sita. Uh, yes, and there are other examples as well. And uh, in Hindi writers have written about it. Uh, I, I want to know from you: was there a trigger from all that, uh, all that tradition, or was it specific and direct in uh, your case? And can I can I state the other part? The other part is about you see. Uh, you have mentioned that it is it is a biofiction. I have also mentioned it, but still I am still curious. Uh, if for you, if you were to quantify, it, and as you said, there were secondary sources. Uh, it has come in the references that you would uh, you took your information from. So how much would it be uh, fiction, and how much would it be history while you narrate everything about this Surya? The fiction is the part which is. Uh the unsaid part. The fiction is the part in the, where the psychologist in me has come into play, where the woman in me has entered into Pasuba and has uh, sculpted or clay modeled reactions to events. But I have been a stickler for events and dates and uh, uh, the happenings of history. I could not tell them because I was dealing with a real life person. So in the sense that if you want me to quantify it, I would say about 40% uh, about of it is fiction. And I won't even call it fiction because it is, it's an interpretation. So what do you call an interpretation? Fact or fiction, I do not. And I have tried very hard to keep, keep perjurative statements out of this. You know, initially, I thought I'll narrate Pasuba's story like Sanjay and the Mahabharat, where it's just a commentary. But I couldn't do that. I did get so deeply into the character and it's funny because my friends started calling me Neil Ba. So I, I got so immersed into Kasuba that uh, I could not remain just the observer. 
and even now when you ask me this, I see I leave it to the readers to interpret what was the Kumbhar strength and her weakness. I have just fleshed out a woman who I is my alter ego, I would say. So uh, I think what Nilima has succeeded in doing is bringing out the conflict that the character of Kasturba must have experienced throughout life. You know, the duty to one's um, designated role in life vis-a-vis -vis one's own desires. So there's that conflict between duty and desire which is there right through the book. Sorry, okay, thank you. This is a very novel idea by you. But I would like to know you as an author, you as a writer, lady writer. The Kasturba, I mean, uh, she dissolved her identity into the shadow of Mahatma Gandhi. So during that time, what was the fear about that? What was the fear of Kasturba? And do you think Kasturba of that time and Kasturi today is fearless also? What was the fear of Kasturba at that time? And do you think Kasturba converted into today's name as a Kasturi? Is she today fearless? How you just propose and how would you put it? I would like to know historical what was the real fear of Kasturba that dissolved the identity herself over shadows by Mahatma Gandhi. Can you just elaborate on I, that? I don't agree with your question. Kasturba did not dissolve her identity. Kasturba had no fear. Kasturba was like the quintessential Hindu Nari. She followed in her husband's path. She supported him in every endeavor. Whether it assaulted her sensibilities, like the greatest turmoil in her life was the conflict between Harilal and his father. Kasupa had no fear. It was a willing submission to her husband. That's what. And today's Kasturba, I don't know if she would have lasted. If I were to be, if, if Gandhiji was my husband today, and I am a, a modern woman of the 21st century, the marriage would have fallen apart in the first one year. Because, you know, the, this generation is so intolerant. Correct. And they grow up with different uh, mindsets. That they feel, you know, they grow up with these <laughs> false feelings of entitlement. That, uh, and they, they're not moved to take life's knocks, let's put it this way. And right. nobody's life is rosy and everybody has to tolerate a bit too. Right. So the word adjustment doesn't exist. Thank you. Quite right that the uh, we know of Kasturba in a really little shots by somebody mentioned her in some cases and all that. And her character can come out as a strong character, as a character, in various other things. How do you, what do you think was the point of view as a very distinctive personality that she had, like you know, we remember Draupadi uh, in a certain way, Sita in a certain way, all that. Yeah, Kasturba is not, I would not like to put her into the mold of a self-effacing, sacrificing persona non grata. No. Kasturba has shown enough grit in, in, in throughout her life where when Gandhiji is absent, she has taken charge. She has gone to jail. She has kept the morale high. She has kept her family and the settlement together. She has lived that austere life in the, in the ashram where even sugar was denied to them and to her children. So she is a very resilient and a very strong woman character. And uh, she, I would put her, uh, you know, in, in all the attributes that you would need or you would expect in a freedom fighter. See, the only disadvantage, if you want to call it that, was that Kasupa was illiterate. But I do not think that that weighed her down in any way. Because had she been more educated, I don't know what thing she would have done differently. So yes, she's a very strong self-righteous and a very uh, ferocious uh, freedom fighter. This is the Kasuba that I would project as. I, I would as well. Yes. 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 This image, it's a very resilient image. You know, it's a very strong image, the photograph. You know. So, um, yeah, that, that's, but, yeah. unfortunately that misinterpretation or misinformation has just stayed in our minds because of Richard Attenborough's film. And I really hope 
happens, my dream would come true if somebody would make a film out of this book. Because I can imagine somebody like Vidya Balan doing this role and doing complete justice to it. <laughs> yes, some more questions in the back. Congratulations on uh, working on such a great subject. And uh, some of the questions are answered, uh, luckily, but like, uh, I would like to know that how long did it take, now that you said so much research, I'm sure you must have put in. So the duration that required a number of years that you must have gone after. Secondly, uh, did she, did Kasturpa have her own ideology as far as freedom struggle was concerned? Because I am also working on the parallel thing, which uh, like not anti Gandhi, but uh, different thought processes. So I would really like to do you have thrown some light on that aspect of uh, what was your first question? The first part, uh, how long did it take? So that, this book has actually taken the longest out of my three books. I've taken eight years, out of which two and a half, three years was research in collecting the material on her. But the research was less of a challenge because I knew that I was dealing with limited material and a lot of the writing would have to be created by me. So that was not the challenge. The challenge was to be able to project myself into Kasturba and to sustain the momentum of her life. So there were periods in those eight years where almost for two years on and off, I just put the manuscript away and I said I won't be able to do it. And there were often periods when I thought that this is going to be my last book, I'll never be able to write again. Because it really, really consumed me and I have, I have felt completely drained after I finished doing this book. And the second part is that uh, you asked if uh, if there's if there's an ideology. No, I I feel that Kasuba did not develop an independent ideology on the freedom movement. She did not oppose Gandhiji's ideology. Uh, there's no evidence to show that she thought differently about truth and non-violence. She may have been silent about it because she didn't believe in it. Because, or she just found it incredible that how will non-violence get us freedom? And she may have questioned it in her own mind. But I think that the the life turning point for her, that point of, of self of revelation, was after the salt act, after that salt march. That that is my interpretation. Any more questions? destined to happen because I was looking for a woman character around the freedom movement and I did look at uh, at uh, Kamla Nehru and Fatima Jinnah and even Sarojini Naidu but um, and initially I have to confess that I found to, to write about Kasturba I thought that this character is too bland what will I write about Kasturba but it's only when I found that there is a whole truth out there which needs to be brought out she needs to be resurrected it's not enough to have universities and roads and maybe a few institutions named after her. She has to be kept alive as much as Gandhiji is alive. So that is how I zeroed in on her and she stoked my, uh, my sensibility.
brave, I have to say. Thank you, Nilima ma'am. Thank you, Anup ma'am. It was really a great session and showing us Kasturba with an another perspective. It was really an indulging session for all of us. Thank you so much. At least we should applaud for this session. It was not just done. Yes. Thank you so much. Next session, Kharkhadat. Bas have a thodi chwarman chalu thashe. Jema Lata Hirani.